Uh, my name is Pete Chadwick. I'm Senior Product Manager, manager at, at SUSE. Um, I'm responsible for our cloud infrastructure products, um, which not surprisingly include an, an OpenStack distribution. Um, joining me today a little bit will be uh, Alok Prakash from, from Intel. What we want to talk about today is it said pets versus cattle um, on the uh, on the agenda. That's not really the intent of this because we don't think that it's a pets versus cattle discussion. We think that people want to run pets on cattle, and at some level, every application, every workload is somebody's pet. So this is kind of an image that I found that really kind of kind of highlights what we think um, <laughs> we're 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 talking about, which is people want to deploy OpenStack. They want to run applications that are, quite honestly, enterprise workloads um, that may or may not be, you know, tiered or you know, Web 2.0 applications may not be designed for designed for cloud. Um, but even if they are, the question is: once you start putting something into OpenStack, how do you make sure that you can meet the same kind of enterprise SLAs that you've historically been meeting for the last 15 years with more uh, either non-cloud solutions or more proprietary solutions? So when we talk about an SLA. There's really you know, two components to it at some level. Um, the first is you need to have reliable infrastructure. Um, one of the things that, that I always talk about is in, in sort of the, the traditional enterprise way of the world, you know, failure is not an option. And you talk to a lot of cloud people and they'll say, yeah, you're right, failure is not an option, it's a feature. Um, and, the, and, the, and the sense of that is that I'm now put, taking um, the responsibility from ensuring reliability at the infrastructure layer away and telling the application developer that he now has to make sure that his applications are, are configured to, a, to assume that failure is going to happen at the infrastructure level. I'll be honest, there are a lot of application development teams um, at the enterprise level. They're scared to death of that um, because it's an entirely different way of thinking about how they develop applications. You know, scale-out developers are fine. I mean, they understand how to do that. They've been doing it in the cloud, um, but there are a lot of a lot of teams that just don't necessarily want to make that leap. So you need to make sure that there's a reliable infrastructure on 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 top of which you can start to build things out. <coughs> Clearly, applications need to be able to handle um, compute node failures, um, but you also, that's kind of sort of the minimum, uh, minimum stakes to get in the business. More importantly is how do I make sure that my cloud is delivering the kind of, uh, the kind of, the, uh, uh, the kind of resources that I need to, to make sure that I'm maintaining my, um, my, uh, my service level agreements. So I need to be aware of the services, I need to be able to detect hotspots, I need to be able to monitor load, um, you know, I need to be able to trigger um, actions through heat or something like that based upon what's going on uh, in my infrastructure. So what I, the structure of this conversation um, this morning is I'm going to talk a little bit about, about some of what are the, the minimal things you need to do in OpenStack to get um, a level of reliability at the infrastructure, and then Alok is going to come and talk about some of the things that Intel has been looking at um, and, and pushing upstream into OpenStack around, around service awareness. <coughs> so first of all, the first question you really have to ask yourself is, okay, I look at a typical um, cloud component, um, and this is based upon the assumption that people are using uh, either some kind of a distribution, uh, pretty much all of, uh, um, certainly SUSE's product, and I think most of our competitors' products, include some sort of a, um, a deployment node. Uh, we call ours the administration server. Um, you know, it, it uses Chef, it uses Crowbar, and that does the physical, physical orchestration of the infrastructure, and then it deploys the OpenStack services on top of that infrastructure. So when we looked at it and said, we're going to start doing high availability, the first question we wanted to ask ourselves was really, what are we trying to protect? Um, are we trying to protect our administration server? Are we trying to pr protect the control plane? Are we trying to protect the guests? Um, quite honestly, we looked at the administration server and said that's something you use when you set something up. It's something that you use when you're trying to maybe upgrade your system. Um, quite honestly, if that goes down, it's not going to affect your users. It's not going to affect your 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 day-to-day -day operations. Doesn't make a lot of sense to spend a lot of time focus on that. Guests is a hard problem. Um, we're looking at ways that we can do that. I'll be honest, we're not there yet. That is an area that we're, uh, that we're working some with, with partners um, to understand how better to do that. There are ways you can do that with um, existing technologies, but it's not, perhaps not as straightforward um, as your application developers and your end users might want to look like. So we decided we wanted to focus on the control plane. So what does that mean? 
So if you look at the control node, um, and that could be multiple control nodes, um, it's where your all the OpenStack services, the database, the message queue, Nova, Glance, Cinder, all those things run. So that's what we focused on um, uh, to make sure things were, were highly available. And it's actually a pretty straightforward solution. Um, you know, since in general OpenStack runs on, on Linux, it's just a set of services that are Linux-based uh, applications. You can use all the traditional Linux high availability um, technologies um, to solve that. Um, and just, just so you understand, I mean, Linux high availability technologies are doing things like keeping uh, air traffic control systems up and running and to keep keep uh, manufacturing man factories up and running. So it's a, it's a solid accepted technology that is, that is being deployed today for mission critical applications. So this is not some kind of um, strange, uh, completely leading edge technology that we should be worried about. Um, so what you do is there's some technologies that you can use, uh, Pacemaker, CoroSync, and HA Proxy are the ones that we use. <coughs> use shared storage for database and message queue. And by deploying those technologies, you can easily get a, a, a completely robust and reliable uh, control infrastructure for, uh, for OpenStack. Now, you know, quick question, why is that important? Well, if your control node goes down, pretty much your cloud goes down. Um, in the first releases of OpenStack that was kind of not too painful, your VMs would typically stay up. But now if you're deploying Neutron, you know, potentially you lose your control node, Neutron goes down, your VMs lose all connectivity. And if you've got 10,000 VMs out there running and all of a sudden they disappear, your customers might want to know why. So at a minimum, sort of the simplified structure um, that, we've, that, that we kind of go out with uh, for customers looking at doing proof of concepts or early pilots, simple two-node structure. Um, you set it up with Pacemaker. Um, you have the two servers there talking with each other. You have the resource agents running on all of the, uh, on all the control nodes um, or all the control services, and it gets you a pretty reliable, a pretty reliable infrastructure. Now, quite honestly, that's not the way we recommend doing it. Uh, most of our customers who are doing pilots actually have three clusters. Uh, the reason for that is the database cluster runs best in a two-node environment with shared storage behind that. Um, it can be, um, and the shared storage could be on, a, on, on something like a, a NetApp box or some other SAN. It does not have to be any, any kind of specialized storage. Uh, so you put RabbitMQ and Postgres on that. Um, because of traffic load, we tend to recommend putting Neutron on its own, on its own cluster right now. Um, I think as technologies like as DVR become more mature and people start implementing that, that may be less of an issue. But right now, Neutron is in the data path for, uh, for networking. And so if you've got a lot of traffic going through, you, you want to have a number of servers that can run active-active to handle that traffic. So we recommend putting that on a, on a, on a separate cluster. And we also recommend doing that on, a, on an odd number of, of nodes. Um, Without going into a whole um, HA discussion, you want to do that to, to guard against fencing problems if one node should, should fail. And then we recommend another three node cluster for every other um, OpenStack service. Um, and, and in general, uh, once you've done that, you're pretty well protected that any single physical server that, that uh, were to go down, um, you know, the rest of your cloud would stay up and continue to function. Function, functioning as normal, and just as a just as a you know a plug for SUSE, we've actually automated all this through our um, deployment technology, so that you go through you you configure the cluster, and then you just install servers services on the cluster, and they're automatically configured with the appropriate resource agents, so that you're up and running in a in a highly available fashion, without necessarily having to go through all of the um, all of the plumbing necessary to get this stuff working together, um, and uh, you know we can. You know, we've got a booth downstairs. If you're interested more in that, we can, we can certainly uh, uh, walk you through that and give you uh, the magic key, which can actually get you set up with a highly available cloud in, in, in a few minutes. So with that, in terms of talking about the infrastructure, um, uh, what I think is really the, some of the more interesting stuff then is, is what about the workloads? What about the services that I want to deliver? And so I'll turn it over to, to Alok to, to kind of go through, to go through that. That picture of the dog sitting on top of the cow was very nostalgic for me from my <laughs> days in India. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about, you know, I, I'm Alok Prakash from I Intel Corporation. I'm going to talk to you about, uh, uh, you know, the problems people face when they're trying to run uh, pet workloads on, 
uh, on, on nodes. So when we've been talking to customers the last two years, and uh, you know the, the the problem that most people were worried about when trying to get pet workloads to run on the cloud, whether it's public cloud or private cloud, and we would encourage people to do pri uh, private cloud, is, uh, you know, first question is trust. It's a multi-tenant, multi-workload environment. Can I trust that uh, the system has not been compromised? The BIOS is okay. The, there's no root tool get there. There's no, uh, the hypervisor is okay. And so that's one class of uh, problem because I'm, I'm multi-tenant. And the other one was in performance, that is, can I have a uh, noisy neighbor? And, uh, and I'll illustrate what those two uh, uh, problems are. And then the third piece is that, how can you assure me that those two problems are not happening on the node as I run my workloads there? So let me take each one of them uh, uh, at a time. So let's talk about performance assurance. You, you get a box, first thing you need to be able to know is, what is the performance that I'm going to get out of this system? So you need some, uh, and uh, you know today people use vCPUs, things like that, but that's not a vCPU on the older generation processor, it's not the vCPU on the current generation uh, system. So that's not a very meaningful number for performance. So that's one big problem, that is how do I create a normalized compute unit? I get a box, I know it has so many service compute units or normalized compute units, and I can divvy it up into VMs as I'm doing that. So that's the first problem. How do I know the capacity? How do I do that? The second problem of performance, is that you can have a noisy neighbor. And what I mean by that is, in a system, you're sharing cache. And you may have a VM that's, let's say, streaming video. It's a media server encoding, decoding something. So it's going to trash the cache. And the performance of the next VM is going to be affected. Today's monitoring tools usually do not monitor at that level. So you would not detect when you are having a, a noisy neighbor problem and you would not be able to prevent or take remedial action. So that, those are the uh, big problems from a, a, a node and running multiple VMs in, a, you know, in that environment. Similarly for trust, that is, you know, I mentioned, uh, how do you know that the, root, you know, the system has not been compromised? Can you run a piece of code in, a, in such a way that uh, you know, it cannot be tampered with, and you can create a white list of, OK, this is the right configuration. And every time the bo uh, node boots, you can make sure uh, it's not been tampered with, and you've, you know, you're OK. So these are the two uh, uh, big challenges. And we, as Intel, have been addressing those. Uh, the first one, from a performance perspective, we have some capabilities in the platform to monitor cache. Uh, and, uh, and we are able to look at the uh, performance uh, from instructions per cycle and uh, cache and correlate the performance and the cache usage and miss cache misses and come up and tell you what is the contention pool. This VM is being aggressive, and those VMs are being affected. Right? So that's a, a key capability, and, and we're making that you know, available. Uh, and we have proposed blueprints to make that part of uh, uh, OpenStack. The, I mentioned the, the so the, these two problems, the nosy neighbor problem and the noisy neighbor problem. For nosy neighbor, we have technologies in our platform. Uh, Intel uh, trusted execution technology, where you can we can run this piece of code that uh, then does the signature of the BIOS and the uh, core components of hypervisor, and then create that white list, and then you know at runtime you can compare it and make sure you know nothing has been compromised. So uh, we did uh, some experiments, and we actually you know built. Uh, uh, a system that could plug into OpenStack, and I'll show you how we did this uh, assurance piece. So it has essentially three components. You've got an agent that's collecting this deep platform telemetry from the system. Uh, and uh, it does the analysis, uh, uh, looks at all of the uh, data, and is able to detect uh, when that noisy neighbor problem is happening. The other one is it, it collects all the data, can send it to an assurance controller, which is a KVM uh, virtual uh, appliance. And we have a plugin in Nova Scheduler, so that uh, plugin is able to plug into the uh, the service chain. So when a customer comes in, says, "Give me a VM, make sure it runs on a trusted compute pool, make sure it has so much performance based on that some normalized compute unit," uh, those extra spec requests are trapped by the uh, the plugin. It is in the filter chain. Uh, it'll look at all the systems to say these systems do not have that trust attestation, so they're you know filtered out. It can look at the cache contention on each of the systems, and it can weigh all those nodes and and give you the node that has the least contention, so that your VM lands and and gets the best performance possible. So this is 
how uh, you know we have uh, instrumented it we have a you know technology if you want to see it it's available in the in the booth downstairs in the intel booth and we can uh, demonstrate that to you and and there are other aspects also that come in one is exa one example would be let's say a fan has failed on a server and it is running hot and the temperature is going up you don't want the next workload to be landing on that system so you want to be able to detect when a system is in an unhealthy state or a gray state and avoid that uh, during scheduling time. So we have a blueprint for that as well uh, that we, we propose. So those are the uh, you know, key use ways you can enhance and run pet workloads and, not, not, and be assured that you don't have a nosy neighbor and a noisy neighbor. Right? And, and, and what I have here is a, are a few screenshots to show you, you, know, how, you know, how we went about implementing it in our controller. Uh, you know, one was to be able to extend the flavors to with uh, burst capacity. You can say, give me, uh, you know, if a host has 20 uh, service compute units and you can then take the VMs and say, for each, each of my work pet workloads, I may want to say it should have a minimum of one compute unit always guaranteed and maybe burst up to two, right, or more. That's a, it's a, so that's a range you can give on what's guaranteed, what's burstable. And we also have capabilities like core pinning. So you can say, for this VM, pin it to a core. So it never, uh, you know, it, it, it's assured that uh, uh, there'll be no noisy neighbors. And we can monitor the cache uh, across all of these pinned cores. So that's an example of how you, how you can make it happen. Uh, we have, you know, uh, on this picture you can see one of these nodes has a little lock icon to indicate that's a trusted node, it has a TPM. And we have this piece of code that's able to attest that the node has not been, you know, uh, doesn't have any uh, issues from a trust perspective. Uh, then, same, similarly, from performance point of view, we can, you know, uh, detect how much of the service compute units are available on the node and how much has been utilized by all of the uh, VMs on the node. We can look at the cont cache contention as well, at the contention level as well. So, uh, and I mentioned if you want to avoid noisy neighbor problem, you may want to pin the cores and, uh, and, and monitor the ca continue to monitor the cache. And when you detect the uh, problem, you want to be able to detect the, which, is the noise, which is the noise maker and which is the uh, you know, uh, noise affected VM, and then take the remedial action. You can move either one of them, evacuate it from the node. Now, th th those are in terms of just basic VMs and noisy neighbors, but you have another problem. You may want to run Ceph, for example, or some other application services on the node, right? So you, don't, you want to make sure that those applications also don't suck up a lot of the resources or affect the performance of your VMs if you're going to be running both. So you have to be able to quarantine both, and that's also a capability that we have experimented, and you can see that uh, in the demo downstairs. So. So uh, I am not going to walk you through these things. So uh, that's basically my intent here was to show you the class of problems that people uh, are thinking of. Uh, and general monitoring tools do not have that capability. And so we are trying to make sure that all of the, uh, you know, that capability, a nosy neighbor, noisy neighbor problem gets uh, addressed. And it gets upstreamed into the OpenStack uh, distributions. We have blueprints <laughs> in place. Uh, the, so you can uh, check out those blueprints and uh, you know and help move some of those uh, capabilities. Now I've talked about some of the capabilities that we have been doing. That is, you know, doing the noisy, noisy neighbor, noisy neighbor, detecting the aggressor, de de aggre detecting the victim VM. But doesn't seem to be moving to the next. Uh, but we are making uh, additional. Let me come out of the node and. Yeah. Should we get out of it and then? Okay. So yeah, but from an Intel perspective, we have uh, you know a lot more capabilities that we are upstreaming. We are among the top ten contributors usually. And uh, uh, but for for this talk, I think the key uh, message that I wanted to give was those two big problems: noisy neighbor problem, noisy neighbor problem. That's what we are, uh, you know, working on actively. 
And we have uh, some blueprints for normalizing the compute unit. So you can just take a VM and say, this is what it should take. And it should work the same regardless of which system you're running on. And the other one, uh, um, yeah. So, so that's, the, you know, we are having some technical difficulty on, on moving the slides well, for some reason. But that's OK. one slide it does not want to present. Yeah. <laughs> OK, let's yeah, keep going. Let's keep moving forward. So that's fine. So yeah, uh, with that, I think you know, uh, uh, if you can look at the blueprints and support us, that'll be great. And uh, uh, you will see uh, the ones that, uh, that I mentioned are you know, by our architect who's uh, submitted them to the blueprints, Murli Sundar. And yeah, so anyway. This let me just move to the, OK, yeah, maybe this, one second, so. We'll put that one slide. Yeah, I just, yeah, I just put that, this slide up. Oh, OK, cool. <laughs> There you go. Oh, technical difficulties. Okay, yeah, I, I was I mentioned some you know uh, some of the blueprints. So the, uh, we have submitted some one uh, blueprint on the normalized compute unit. I'm hoping all of you will support it, make it happen. We've submitted one on the platform health, which is you know the like I mentioned, if a system is get in, not in a good state, we can use IPMI to detect the health of the state, make sure that the NOAA scheduler and the scheduling algorithms and the tech is smart enough to avoid those nodes. Uh, and of course, uh, the contention pool that I mentioned. You know, how do you know who's the noise maker, who's the uh, aggressor victim, and how do you find out the VMs that are being affected? And you can, and we do that with some statistical algorithms, as well as capabilities that are in the Intel processor to uh, act, act at that level. Okay. And with that, so I think I think that was kind of what we wanted to share with you. So obviously, if there are questions for either uh, for either Alok or myself. Um, Feel free, raise your hands. Or if you're curious to find out more, yep. uh, the demos are available in, in, in the demo is available in the Intel booth. So I invite you to come over there and, and check it out. Question, um, what kind of SLAs do you think you would be able to achieve with the HA scheme with the current uh, I mean I don't I hesitate to declare numbers of nines, um, but certainly we have I mean that infrastructure is being used by Air traffic control. So I mean, it's 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 in general pretty reliable from a from a physical perspective. Um, in terms of, of doing the monitoring, I think it's it's really a question of once you track it, then what kind of remediation do you want to put in, and how fast do you want to do you want to track it? But I but but in general, we're pretty comfortable that you can you can meet the SLAs you need to meet. Yeah, and if you're a service provider and you want to offer services, so you can say, here's my normal uh, VM, if you want to rent out this VM. But if you want the VM to be running only in a trusted compute pool and have almost so much guaranteed performance, you know, here's additional SLA attributes that you can add on and, and price it more. And use tools that we are talking about to then charge the customers for, for that and provide that service and give them that security and safety that they're looking for for their pet workloads. Okay. Yeah. Um, repeat the question. Yeah. So the the question was, uh, you know, in in in, uh, in a regular production environment, you may do BIOS updates, things like that. And how does the customer get back that information of, you know, when uh, assurance has been done at the for the trust level? Uh, so uh, in the in our demo, uh, if you come down to the booth, we can uh, demonstrate how it's done. But essentially, what you would do is you would create a log of uh, every time the system booted, what the attestation status was and have that in the log and then generate a report that says your VM ran on these nodes. All of these nodes were always attested to be, uh, to not have had any of these uh, things. That is, you know, they, they matched a white list of uh, known good uh, BIOS, hypervisor, and other parameters that you might have uh, uh, specified. Yeah, I, I'd highly encourage you to come to the Intel booth, and then we can spend more time explaining how it is and, and all of the technologies uh, involved. Go ahead. Uh, 
so right now we have uh, yeah we have uh, submitted the blueprints but if you want to uh, talk to us about contributing to it uh, we can talk offline and and get you you know uh, I, I think he was really asking yeah. can you get a can a can, hold can of the code to, to do get some the testing code. Uh, I, like I mentioned, we know the demo that we're doing. All of the code is integrated in there, but we are in the process of breaking it apart so it can be, you know, made into blueprints. It's not ready right now, but it'll be very shortly available. Uh, uh, RIC, our architect is there who's proposed these things, and uh, he might be able to. Uh, Murli Sundar <coughs> is our principal engineer, and he might be able to, uh, you know, chat with you and then figure out how to get that code. Yes. Are there any um, tax or enterprise workloads you discourage someone from running? So, so, so the question is, are there any are any specific enterprise workloads that we would discourage anyone from running? Um, I'll be honest. Our initial our initial assumption going into some discussions with with customers and proofs of concept was that you know there there clearly were a class of applications that they would not want to to migrate. Um, and we have been surprised about how aggressively customers are looking to migrate workloads. And uh, I think it's, you know, it's some of that's just they go through the testing process and see what works and what doesn't. Um, and they clearly are identifying, you know, low-hanging fruit initially to say, uh, you know, to say these are workloads that we feel comfortable with moving or they're, they're doing brand new applications, greenfield applications that they can, that they can code to be cloud aware. But most of them have visions that they're going to migrate most of their application workloads over at some point. And they just assume that, the, that, that we're going to evolve the technology rapidly enough, either through these kinds of technologies or, you know, we've got some partners working on even fault tolerant capabilities at the guest level that can really address almost any workload at that point. You know, I, I guess the, the, the other way I'd answer the question is there's two ways to look at, at OpenStack. You know, the first way to look at OpenStack is it is a way for me to deploy, to deploy modern cloud infrastructures to do cloud-aware applications. The other way to look at it is it's a great way for me to automate the orchestration of my infrastructure in a fairly lightweight fashion. And, and if you start to take that second view, which is the data center of the future is going to be OpenStack APIs and everything below doesn't matter, then you start to say, I'm going to move all my workloads. And we have customers that are starting to, to look at it that way. OK, if there are no more questions, you know, we'll give you 10 minutes back. Um, you know, we'll stick around here for a little while if you want to come up and ask questions. Um, yeah, exactly. Obviously, come down to, to either the Intel booth or the SUSE booth, and we're more than willing to, uh, to provide you more, more discussions. <laughs> And free USB keys to, to, to set up OpenStack in a hurry. In fact, Pete, I'll take that.